Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. This is Nick Pateras for the Sons of a Pitch, an American Soccer Podcast. Coming to you across the table from my good friend, fellow host, Michael Yalmi. Mike, you ready to talk some soccer tonight? Absolutely. There is a lot going on around the American soccer landscape. As a matter of fact, we are right smack dab in the middle of the second half of the U.S. Open Cup final between Minnesota and Atlanta United. And uh, so if you hear any screams while we're recording this, you know something crazy happened in the game. We're going to try and give you some breakdown of that later on in the show. We're also going to get to some listener feedback. And then we're going to recap the headlines around the MLS along with, you know, recap of the games, what happened, rivalry week. Ri- rivalry week? Did I, did I kind of stumble over that? Heineken rivalry week. Heineken rivalry week. Yes, that's correct. We can't forget the sponsors. Exactly. Uh, the MLS. And we can't forget our sponsors. So thank you to Donovan Food Brokerage and Nice Iceland Premium Pure Spring Water. Uh, for sponsoring us. If anyone else out there wants to jump on the sponsorship wagon for the Sons of the Pitch, uh, Mike has been putting out a lot of great videos on YouTube for picks, kind of giving a behind-the-scenes look at our recording. Go on, find those videos at Sons of the Pitch Soccer uh, on YouTube, and we're more than happy to display your product or or throw a little pitch in there for you for a few bucks. So reach out to us either on Twitter, at SOP Soccer, as well as on email, at uh, podcast at sons of a pitch soccer.com and that goes for all of you fans and listeners out there too. reach out to us let us know what you think matter of fact we got some great feedback on Twitter uh, this past week lots of feedback this week so our newest followers DJ Jason Brower inter 305 a Miami supporter group who puts out a lot of great content about inter Miami FC the expansion process what's going on go ahead nice. follow them at Inter underscore 305 on Twitter for all your latest Miami news. Additionally, thanks to Eric Zarens, Rob Schindler One, J- Jonathan Wilson, the Siege Supporters Group at Siege Miami, another Miami. Couple FC. Inter Miami supporters groups jump so on as, the Sons of a Pitch bandwagon. As all the right. league is growing, so are we. You so got it. thank you all for your support on Twitter. Uh, as well as everyone on Facebook who has liked our videos, liked our pics, liked everything that we're doing. Uh, thank you to Joanna Petrowski castle Barbara Alekna, uh, as well as my dad, Ted Pateras, jumping nice. on, watching a few videos. So uh, <laughs> thanks, Dad. I, I know you said that it was you know something nice for you to fall asleep to, and that's why you're watching our videos and listening to our things. But uh, I, you're, you're giving us you got to start somewhere, I right? I guess that's, that's where we're at. <laughs> Um, thank you to everyone who's, who's following along on, on YouTube. Um, if you want to go ahead and watch watch on YouTube, I'm going to give a quick shout-out. Rock Run Express Soccer Club, Rockford, Illinois. That's where I started my career playing it from 92 to 96. So uh, Here's a real team, TFC. Well, maybe, maybe not. Well, maybe well, I shouldn't go that far. First of all, Rock Run <laughs> is a real team, was a real team. Uh, I don't know if you're saying Toronto isn't real this year, Mike. But That's can... kind of where I'm going with it. All right, good. We can get into that later. But anyway, <laughs> uh, shout out to everyone who's played in Rockford, uh, for Rock Run, as, as well as anyone who's played in the Rainbow Tournament, the Watermelon Tournament, and, and all the great soccer coming out of my hometown of Rockford, Illinois. Nice. Anyway, that takes care of the shout outs. We got some questions that need answering, Mike. We got questions from the Studs Up Report. At Studs Up Report, another great soccer Twitter account, blog, podcast. Listen to these guys. Go check them out. They want to know who needs to play desperate footy. Who in the MLS, as playoffs are approaching, you can just feel the suspense thickening. Like the lights are dimming, the music is getting low and dramatic. It's getting close. It's getting towards the end of the season. Who needs to play desperate, Mike? What's your quick answer for that? You know, the, the quick answer is uh, really anybody who's sitting in like the fifth, sixth, or seventh spot in each conference uh, down through like eight, nine, and ten, those six spots, every single one of those teams. So if you, you know, you're looking at the East, DC United, New England Revolution, Toronto FC, Montreal Impact, Orlando, and Chicago. If I really had to highlight two teams that really have to play desperate right now, it would be. Uh, Chicago Fire, for sure. That team is right on the brink of elimination. Uh, they're really close. Even they're sitting at 33 points out of 29 games, and they really have to win almost the rest of their games in order to get into that last playoff spot. I think uh, if they lose a game, they're mathematically eliminated. That could be. I think. That could be. So they, they need some desperate uh, soccer. 
Uh, and then I would say as well, I think DC United really needs to start playing some desperate soccer. They, they've got a goal differential of negative two. They're really hurting right now, and uh, they need to turn it around and turn it around quick. My Eastern Conference team that needs to play desperate is Orlando City. I've been ragging on them the entire podcast for the last two years. Like, you know my feelings about Dom Dwyer, and you know my feelings about how Question has underperformed ever since he made his transfer uh, from New York to Orlando City. You know how I think Chris Mueller should be playing a lot more, but you also know how much I like James O'Connor, and I think his players are just underperforming for him, and he's doing the best that he can, not to mention... Uh, with Joel Bendick in goal, you never know what you're going to get on a given night. Joel Bendick? Or, I'm sorry, who's the... What, where, <laughs> Brian, where am I thinking? Brian, Brian Rowe. Rowe. Brian Rowe. You're correct, Mike. Brian Rowe, but my point stands. You're never, you, you don't really know what you're going to get with him on a given night. Is he going to stand on his head, or is he going to give up a gaffer? You don't know. So, Orlando City, for all their signings, for all the hype that they've built around themselves, for the fact that this is their fourth season? Fifth year. Fifth season in the MLS... They need to make the playoffs for a number of reasons. Uh, if, if anything, just to give the fans a vote of confidence in this team. Right. Uh, if they want them to re-up their season tickets, if they want them to spend their time and money on this team, time to uh, time, time to make a desperate run to the playoffs. So that, that's my Eastern Conference pick right there, Mike. Okay. Moving on to the Western Conference, uh, some teams that really need to play some desperate soccer. Uh, I think you've got uh, one that really stands out for me is Portland Timbers. Uh, this team has had a bunch of games at home lately. They have that backfill schedule with home games because of them redoing Providence Park. Uh, but they're still on the outside looking in, right? They started out really bad. Then they started to pick up a few results. Then they kind of went on a run and started looking really good. And now they're playing really bad again. So I'm thinking they really have to, uh, to get some desperate soccer right now to pull into that last playoff spot with these home games they've got left. I'm going to go out on a limb here with this, this desperate pick and say it's Sporting Kansas City. You're right, Portland was kind of banking on this run of home games to end the season, so they really do need to play desperate footy to make sure that they take advantage of that. But Kansas City, as terrible as they had been in the beginning of the season, as unfortunate as they had been with a slew of, of injuries and, and everything else going on, they are still sitting six points out of that last playoff spot. They have 34. Dallas, who right now is sitting in seventh, has 40 points. And Sporting Kansas City's got a game in hand. So if Kansas City can just play, just pardon the pun here, balls out soccer for the rest of the season, uh, if they can play that desperate play, if their young guys can step up, if Peter Vermees can pull some sort of magic out of his hat, Kansas City's got an outside shot at making the playoffs despite as terrible a year as they have been having. They do, and that's crazy to me. With how bad that they have played this season, the fact that they still have a chance to make it is quite impressive. It, impressive? And some would say that's a criticism of the MLS. Like, you know your league's not good enough yet because that can happen. Right. You can, you can suck for two-thirds of the season, make a run at the very last – get into the playoffs and then you never know what will happen so we're not going to get into a playoff discussion format here tonight but something to keep in the back of your heads fans listeners supporters of the league true the one other team and this is going to kind of segue into our next kind of uh our next listener question fc dallas again they're sitting on that seventh line and like we just said eight and nine portland and kansas city if they play desperate enough then they certainly can can make a run at that seventh spot so Dallas needs to play better soccer. And we actually got a question in from Michael Hobart at Michael 601439199 saying, is Dallas turning it around? So let's take a look at, at Dallas's fixtures. Let's answer Michael's question and see uh, if, if you think Dallas can, can really make a run here and solidify their playoff position, Mike. So, what the fuck? Where the hell did it go? You just had it. I, 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 there it is. Yeah, you're good. That's all you need. Yeah, but we need October, man. Yeah, it's October. There's only one oh, match in October. October. Oh, there we go. So, what were the relaxed results? Mm -hmm. Oh. 
the guru another tab for the results? The short answer is yes. So Dallas's last results were a 5-1 drubbing of the Dynamo, which we'll get into during our, our weekly roundup. 3-3 draw with Montreal. 2-0 loss to the Galaxy. A beat down on Minnesota, 5-3, and then a loss to Orlando City. So those are the last five results. So they've won, won a couple, drew one, you know, kind of middling results there. But their next several matchups are against Cincinnati, Chicago, Seattle, New York City, Colorado, and then they end the, end the season with a game against Kansas City. So, Mike, based on that, based on Michael Hobart's question here, uh, is Dallas turning their season around, and are they going to have a, a good shot at the playoffs here? Yeah, for sure. They're, they're definitely going to have a good a good shot at the playoffs. Uh, this team, with, with the results that they've had, uh, that, that draw against Montreal was a huge comeback, down 3-0, uh, to come back and tie it up on the road and get a point. Uh, the big result in the Houston against Houston in the Texas Derby. Now you got an FC Cincinnati side that's just in shambles right now. So that should be three points. Uh, Chicago Fire, they should be able to go into Chicago and win that game, especially if they're playing hot. Uh, Sounders and New York City would be tough games. Maybe they can pull out a result in one or two of those matchups. Uh, then Colorado and Sporting Kansas City are pretty pretty easy matchups to take the points as well. So I think they've got they, they've got a good schedule ahead of them. And they're playing some decent soccer right now that they should be able to make that run into the playoffs. Right. I, w I wouldn't count on them beating Seattle in Seattle. You never know what they do at home against New York City, but I still think NYCFC has the edge in that. rest of the games, they should, should win. Right. I mean, I'm not even saying, like, well, maybe a draw, maybe they take a point or splits it. No, they should win the rest of the games. They should but win. But it's, it's MLS, so you're going to have one in there where right. they, like, go to Chicago and they, they get blown out 5 nothing, or, well, that's that, that's really far okay, Maybe that's a little but, bit too much for know, Chicago. Or they, they did it to know, Atlanta, though. I don't know. Right. They might lose at home to Sporting Kansas City. Or, you know, they might win on the road at Seattle. You know, it, it's MLS, man. You never right. know. And we just talked about how Kansas City needs to play desperately. So you never right. know what that last matchup is going to do. Maybe that's, that Decision game day. decides yeah. the seventh place team in right. the Western Conference. It could. And, and at that point, then it's a coin flip. Yep. Uh, but, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I, I do want to point out that you said, you know, if Dallas gets hot against Chicago, and I just kind of found that really funny considering <laughs> Dallas used to be the burn and then they're playing the fire, and you want to talk about which team's going to get hot at the end of the season. So that's that was just on my kind of like dead joke, pun, okay. kind of trivia thing going on in my head at all times. Just wanted to, <laughs> to lay that out there for you. So, Michael, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, I think Dallas has got a real shot. And once you get in the playoffs again, they, Dallas probably isn't going to be anyone's favorite right. to make a run to the MLS championship. But you never know. It's a one yeah. game, one one game, game playoff. You never know. So that being said, we want to highlight one other piece of uh, fan interaction that we got, listener interaction. I want to give a shout-out to Jason Grimley at futsalallstar.com. Uh, if you guys don't know what futsal is, go look it up. It's extremely popular in South America, and I think yeah. the easiest way to describe it is like it's indoor soccer with a small ball, and it's on a court instead of a field or a pitch. Okay. And it's maybe the the soccer equivalent of handball, I guess, if you hmm. want to think of it that way. Yeah. Really high pace, extremely high technical ability because you're in such a small enclosed space, and it's such a fast paced game. You see a lot of current world stars growing up playing this game. Like Neymar said that this really helped him develop his footwork and technical ability was growing up playing futsal and then eventually getting out on the pitch. So Jason wrote us saying that he's part of this group uh, that's putting on this international futsal tournament down in Miami on September 23rd and 24th. They've got teams from the U.S., Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil Tickets are very affordable. I think you can get in for 20 bucks to see some, some world-class international futsal here. So go to futsalallstar.com, F-U-T-S-A-L, allstar.com. Check it out. See what they're all about. By the way, there is a futsal league here in the United States. Pretty sure that's the league that Landon Donovan bought in into not too long ago. Huh. So he thinks we can grow the game in the United States. Obviously, Jason Grimley and everyone uh, at FutsalAllStar.com thinks we can grow the game, so 
go check it out. And uh, Jason, if there's any other, anything else that, that you want our listeners to know about, just shoot us, shoot us a message on that. So that's kind of uh, my, my plug. That's kind of our, our listeners' hey, Miami, segment. Where this tournament's going to be in Miami, a uh, good chance for these uh, new Inter-Miami supporters groups that are following us, uh, Inter 305 uh, and the Siege. Head on out there. Check it out. Bring some people out. Float that, uh, that International de Football Miami uh, out there and, you know, get those guys out there and, and enjoy some soccer. Absolutely. Futsal, football, whatever you want to call futsal, it. Futsal, futsal. There you go. And, uh, okay, Mike, so with that, let's get into some real soccer talk here now. Okay. You want to go U.S. Open Cup? It just went final. Or do you want to you want to hit some headlines, some roundup? What Let, do you think let's get do? into the games, man. Let's talk a little bit about uh, this U.S. Open Cup final just went final. Uh, the final that just went final. Yes, I said it. You're on, you're I had a little mix up on, uh, on my YouTube channel the other day too with talking about the Canadian Championship, Championship, and whatever. <laughs> uh, anyways, so the final is Atlanta United gets it done, two to one victory at home over Minnesota United, and they're now the Campeones Cup for this season champion as well as the U.S. Open Cup champion. What do you think, Nick? Well, this is the Atlanta United that everyone expected that's finally showed up. It was a slow start to the season, didn't do as well. You know, they were supposed to win Champions League. They were supposed to best Toronto FC's run from a couple of years ago. Right. Didn't work out in Champions League. Beginning of the season started slow. There was questions about locker room stability. There's questions about coaching and tactics and all these changes that Frank DeBoer was putting in place. But you know what? Still at Joseph Martinez. Yeah. Pity Martinez, you had Ezekiel Barco, you had great talent, solid back line, Leandro Gonzalo Perez shutting down opposing teams, Brad Guzan still playing high quality. You really thought they were going to turn it around at some point, and certainly, sure enough, they did. They're back in, what, top three in the Eastern Conference right now? Yeah, right, right now they're number one in the East. Number one in the East, and they just won the U.S. Open Cup. They played the soccer that they needed to during this run. They were very well managed. The team has gelled. And, hey, another trophy. Another trophy for Atlanta United. You, you can't argue with trophies, Mike. No, you can't. You really can't. So the, the, the one thing that stood out to me uh, in, the, in this game, obviously they had a huge home field advantage, yeah. being able to play at the Benz. And sidebar, pardon my attorney talk, sidebar, we're going to have to get into that in a second. Um, but... You were at the Benz, you were at home, and it looked like they really controlled the game. You know, I didn't get to watch the full 90, but from what I did see, and for the majority of the second half, even with Minnesota pressing to get that equalizer, it looked like Atlanta controlled the game. Yeah, yeah, Atlanta definitely in the beginning, they were, were all over it. Um, really funny goal to start things off, the first goal. Uh, the uh, LGP, I'm just going to go with that. It's a lot easier than saying his full name. Uh, you know, comes crashing down the wing and uh, goes to put in a cross, maybe a shot. I don't know. Gets deflected off the leg of the Minnesota defender who was trying to, you know, to block it. And it goes up in the air. Manone goes, jumps up to try and bat it away, misses it. It hits into the side of the net, and it's one nothing. Uh, Atlanta at that point kind of took off. I had to do a few things around the house, and next thing I know, it's 2 nothing. Uh, then I drove over here, and I get here, and Minnesota had pulled one back, 2-1, to one, uh, and then, you know, it just got, Minnesota was pressure, putting pressure on Atlanta. All of a sudden, a second yellow to LGP. He gets sent off in the 73rd, 74th minute, and uh, kind of opened up a little bit more for Minnesota to try and get that equalizer. A couple great chances towards the end of the game but just could not get it to fall. And uh, Atlanta United is the U.S. Open Cup champions for 2019. There you go. The the oldest professional sports tournament in America, champions Atlanta United. Uh, the one little sidebar I wanted to, wanted to speak out on, uh, Vito Minone was quoted before the game as saying that Atlanta hosting this final was unfair. Now, we all know how big of a home field advantage Atlanta United right. has. And, and, and honestly, so do the loons. And I was going to say that yeah. That if they were playing in, in Allianz Field up in Minneapolis, like that would be a really nice home field advantage for the Loons. So I, I'm not 100% familiar with how the U.S. Open Cup determines the final. I don't know if it's based on geography or goal differential or, or some formula. It's by a draw. It's, it's just by a draw. Just by a draw. So when the four teams go into the semifinals, 
they go into a draw and uh, they decide who can host, you know, who has the best chance of hosting. And then there's one team that doesn't have a chance to host. And then the other three teams have a chance. But if that one team like Atlanta, if they won their semifinal matchup, they were in. Period. It was at yeah. Mercedes. That's why we knew the final was there when they beat Orlando before the Portland and, uh, and Minnesota game even happened. Okay. So I get where he's coming from as far as a draw. <sighs> you know, but look, it's there, there should maybe instead of a draw, put something in place, more points in the current MLS season. Or Well, you can't you know, do that because there is the chance that a non-MLS team makes the final. I mean, that's the whole point of the right, tournament is right, that it's true. open to everybody. That, right. So there, you can't base it on the MLS. Okay. And, and the U.S. Open Cup, for that matter, is a distinct entity from the MLS. Right. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, but there's got to be some type of tiebreaker, some, some way to put this together so that it's not just supposed sure. luck. Now, let me tell you something, and I, I know kind of where I would be going if I was a Minnesota United fan. All right? You've got Mercedes-Benz Stadium, probably one of the best stadiums in North America at this, at this point in time. Sure. Uh, they're, they sell tons of tickets. It's good for the league to have these finals there. It is. Campione's Cup had decent TV ratings, great sales, you know, ticket sales, all that kind of stuff. MLS Cup in Atlanta last year, huge. They're, they're you know, they're getting 70,000 plus. Some of the biggest games. soccer crowds in American history. Right. Not just MLS. We're talking right. World Cups. We're exactly. talking old NASL records. Exactly. Everything. Right. So, you know, tinfoil hat, part of me comes in and says... <laughs> Of course they want this final in Atlanta, right? You, especially when they, the game that they did have in Allianz Field, the semifinal against Portland, they didn't even sell any tickets in the upper deck. You know, it was, uh, they had a hard time selling tickets to that game because of the short notice. So I get that. It's not all True. on the fans for not showing up. Midweek but, games are hard right, for working families it to is. get to. Right, but, you know, look, it, midweek games, tell that to the people in Atlanta. They, they put in 40000 They didn't open the upper deck, but they put in 40000 a night. So... You know, it, it's good for the league to have it there, but they need to put something in place to make it a little bit sure, not just a flip of the coin, right? And something so, a little more objective. Than, right. Then again, what's more objective than a coin flip? I guess if you think about it in, in its simplest terms. Well, yeah. You but the, the one other thing Manoni said too is like, you know, oh, I come from European football, and this wouldn't happen. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, European football tournaments like how? We could play at neutral sites. I, I, I'm not too familiar with. Usually, the, with the domestic, domestic cup pubs. finals usually are played in, uh, in, uh, you know, usually like in England there, Wimbledon, uh, no, at Wembley. Wembley. Yeah. Excuse me, I'm not, you know. Tennis. Sorry, Wimbledon's there yeah, too. You know what? Okay. Ten- tennis. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Uh, but you get in Italy. You know, sometimes at the, the Olympic Stadium in Rome. Uh, you know, it's usually a neutral site. But neutral sites don't work in the U.S. right now. Right. They just don't, and and that's. It's different. When you're talking about an England and you're talking about the FA Cup, it's different than you are in the U.S. Open Cup. I mean, if you put this game in Dallas, how many people do you think are going to that game? I mean, just knowing the Atlanta fan base, I'm sure they'd have a large contingent. Oh, you're sure right. Would. You're not going to sell as many tickets, say, right. in Dallas. Or Kansas City has kind of become like an unofficial soccer training headquarters for the U.S. or yeah. something like that. So if you had a final, say, in New York, in Dallas, in Kansas City, or, or shoot, even in LA at this point, I don't think you're going to sell the number of tickets. You're not going to get the interest as you would having it at one of the two teams that are playing in right. its home stadium. That's why MLS Cups, the MLS Cup used to be in a, a neutral site every year. And then they just got away from that because it just wasn't working for them. Yeah. Um, so maybe one day it'll get there, but as of now, it is what it is. One thing I do want to touch on before we move on to the rest of these games through rivalry week and some headlines uh, is when I was watching towards the end of the game, right after that red card to LGP, yeah. Minnesota made a sub. Player that came on was Darwin Quintero. What? what? He didn't start this game? Are you kidding me? Like, what? I need, I need an explanation. Right now, I really hope in the post-game presser, Adrian Heath has a good excuse on why Darwin Quintero was not starting this game from the get-go. I'm hoping he has a torn ACL or something like that, that he couldn't really get on until the 75th minute. Well, if it's a torn nuts. ACL, he's not coming You know what I'm saying. But I get where you're, you know get where what you're coming from. Yeah, like, for your best, arguably your best player, the building block face of your franchise at this point, for him not to be playing in the biggest game in your club's history, 
And I'm not just talking about your three years in MLS. I'm talking about your 50 some years, 30, 40 some years of existence right. as an organization, as a club, as a Minnesota soccer team. This is the biggest game in Loon's history. And your best player starts the game on the bench and doesn't get in till the 74th minute. Like, if you wanted to bring him in at halftime, you know, if you saw something that Atlanta was doing and you knew he could exploit it, or if you were going to bring him in at like the 55th, 60th at the latest, I might give you a pass because you wanted him to have fresh legs or do something different, take Atlanta by surprise. But if you're going to bring him in and only let him play 20 minutes, it's ridiculous. You're, you're right. It's ridiculous. And you're, I, I do hope Heath has a, gets grilled by the press on this one. I yeah. really hope the reporters ask him a thousand questions about Quintero. Yep, I agree. So, moving on, let's talk a little bit about Rivalry Week, shall we? And the few games leading up to Rivalry Week. Had a few games on the Wednesday. Uh, we had New York City FC hosting Columbus Crew. Crew's team that had won six or had been unbeaten in six straight. Uh, New York City took an end to that one with the one nothing shutout. Castellanos with the goal for New York City. They keep on winning. Castellanos has really come into his own for, for NYCFC. And I saw some graphic as far as like the top goal scorers in the league. New York City has Castellanos and Heber as like maybe like the seventh and ninth top goal scorers in the league. Okay. I think they each are sitting with like maybe 13, 14 goals. So you've got two guys who are legitimate scoring threats. You add in Maxi Morales and the rest of the supporting crew. Sorry, supporting New York City FC players. Bad pun there. You'll like they're a legit team to make a run in the playoffs. So no surprise at the result. I'm kind of surprised it was only one nothing though. Yeah, to be yeah. honest. Yep. DC United hosting New York Red Bulls. DC United after that 12-hour travel day after playing in Vancouver and Ugh. losing to Yikes. the Woeful Whitecaps, uh, came back at home to lose to New York Red Bulls two to one. So is this the Atlantic Cup? Is that is that the, what they're calling the Atlantic this one? Cup? Yes, the I, Atlantic Cup. Yeah. And, and more of Rooney's complaining about travel accommodations and oh, it's so terrible. You never get this in Europe. Like, yeah. Yeah, because your your country is the size of an American state, right? <laughs> and yeah. one of the smaller ones at that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, sorry, Wayne. That's that's just the reality of playing the MLS. And uh, unfortunately, you're not getting your results. Again, yeah. DC United continues that slide, and uh, New York playing some better football to end the season. Yeah. LAFC hosting San Jose Earthquakes. This one was not even close. 4 nothing. LAFC, just a complete drubbing. Uh, you had Rossi, Vela with two goals, and Josh Perez with a final capper there for the 4 nothing victory. Uh, Vela keeps scoring. The man is at, I think, 26 or 27 goals now in the season. Uh, just a great game by LAFC. Yeah, actually, what's kind of surprising is San Jose actually had the possession edge, 53-47, though a lot of that came at the very beginning of the game and at the very end of the game when you expect LAFC just kind of hunker down and play a little more defensively. So that that maybe kind of skewed some of the skewed some of these statistics there. But again, Vela having himself a game. Now Vela did pick up a knock in that in, in El Trafico against uh, the LA Galaxy, so we'll see we'll how talk that. About uh, that affects him moving forward. But we're going to move forward to the next game uh, on Rivalry Week. And this is kind of an odd Rivalry Week matchup. And if I keep saying Rivalry Week, I'm going to just keep like coming out <laughs> like I, I have a speech impediment. Why will we... I, Why I'm, I'm done. Why will uh, we... On, on Heineken Week here on MLS. <laughs> um, Sporting Kansas City hosting Minnesota United. So, I don't know, you want to call it like a Midwest matchup? Um, yeah, I think they, they want they want to make that kind of a, a rivalry even though it really isn't one um but they're, they're trying they you know they're they're manufacturing he's got to have a knock man did he come into the game uh usually he'll have a sub or something that's it Right. 
Yeah, but once St. Louis comes in the league, I think that's going to be Kansas City's main focus. So, hey, maybe Minnesota and Chicago can get something going. I don't know. We'll maybe. See. Chicago maybe. needs something. Chicago will have a St. Louis. They'll be kind of picking with that. But uh, we'll, in do a, we'll do a Midwest Cup, Mike. How about it? Like, 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 like a Cascadia, a Cascadia thing. It'll be Minnesota, Chicago, St. Louis, Columbus. I, I don't know. We're, we're stretching things here. <laughs> we we're are stretching. stretching. We are stretching. Uh, this was Sporting Kansas City beats Minnesota one nothing, and uh, you know you're thinking, eh, whatever. Minnesota is getting ready for that U.S. Open Cup final uh, on Tuesday night against Atlanta, and Darwin Quintero came in on as a sub in this game in the 70th minute. So I'm thinking, man, why, uh, they rested him a bit for Tuesday night. Why is he only coming in in the 74th, 75th minute in the U.S. Open Cup final? Yeah, usually does he have a see- knock? Usually like, see him start the game and then get pulled early if you're trying to rest right. him. Not, you don't bring him in at the end of the game to, to play his hardest for a half hour. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it's weird. So I'm thinking maybe there's an injury there. Maybe he's in the doghouse. I don't know. We'll, we'll find out, I'm sure. Yeah, but even so, Eric Hurtado for Kansas City bags the winner in the 88th minute. So it, it appeared to be a fairly even matchup throughout the game, and Kansas City just finds a way to win towards the end. So... Good three points for KC. Yes, on to Friday we go. Uh, two big time rivalry matchups, a manufactured rivalry in Orlando City. You keep saying Austin. manufactured, Mike. When are we going to acknowledge that Orlando City and Atlanta is an actual rivalry game? It's They're not. geographically located. They've been linked uh, as recent MLS clubs. They, you know, they've been signing big players, They're competing in the same U.S. Open Cup kind of geographic bracket. Kind of if Orlando would ever actually advance far enough to play Atlanta. Well, they did this year. And then we saw the result. And we saw the result. So, I don't know. I, I just, it's, it doesn't seem like a true rivalry to me. I think it's, it's you know, it, I think they've blown this rivalry thing way out of proportion. You've got Portland, Seattle. You've got LA, LAFC. You've got Montreal, Toronto. You've got New York City and New York Red Bulls. Even Red Bulls DC has got a lot of history. Oh, I know there's history there, but those aren't true rivalries. I Look, don't don't say that to so, DC or, oh, or, know, or Red Bull former Metro star. You want to go back those those players had some some really there was some bad blood, man. Oh, you go back sure. and look at some highlights and, and some clips and some great kind of compilation videos that the league and fans have put together. There's a lot of bad blood there, but I. I I think then that actually goes more towards your point that Atlanta and, or- and Orlando don't have a geographic rivalry in the sense that those teams do. They don't have uh, a bad blood attitude, familiarity breeds contempt kind of rivalry like they right. do. And you don't have two really good teams playing each other. Yeah, and, and, and teams winning some and losing some. I right. mean, that, you kind of need teams to be kind of even in that respect to have a rivalry. And I know it's a small sample size because they're both so new in the league, but Atlanta has dominated this. You, I don't think yeah. Orlando has won yet. I that sounds right to me. So, and that continued with Atlanta winning one nothing over Orlando at Exploria Stadium uh, on Friday night. So, enough for that one. I want to talk a little bit more about Seattle Sounders going into Portland and getting a two to one victory over the Portland Timbers. I picked Portland. I thought Portland would win this game. I'm waiting for them to start winning these games they have at home. And they couldn't get it done. You keep picking them. Maybe they'll win one. Maybe. maybe. Or if I don't pick them, they'll be, you know, the opposite will happen. Because that's happened a few times. That's true. That's see my Toronto MO. FC pick for this week as well. It's not wonderful. Yeah. Anyway, you want to jump into Seattle, the Seattle victory. Yeah, so, you know, Seattle came in and just really put their foot down on Portland. And really took over the game and just absolutely dominated the game. They took advantage of the silence in the first you know, 15, 20 minutes or so. 33 minutes. The the, the supporter sections were silent okay. for the first 33 minutes. Sorry I wasn't, you know, that glued to it uh, to, to be able to figure that out. But, uh, you know, they, they took advantage of that right from the get-go and, and scored in the first 20 minutes there. It was 22nd minute. Christian rolled on, uh, assisted from Rui Diaz. And then uh, Rui Diaz scores again just after halftime. That guy keeps scoring goals. Uh, Seattle's really doing well through him and Jordan Morris. Um uh, Valeri brings one right back to kind of put this one in game-on mode. And uh, from that point on, it was just a great game. Uh, really, really close. You know, lots of lots of chances on both sides. And, uh, you know, Portland did have the edge as far as shots and possession went. 
but really a great road victory by Seattle. They played extremely well and uh, definitely deserved the full three points in this one. Yeah, Seattle did a great job not only of controlling the game when, when they were on offense, but defensively they really neutralized Brian Fernandez. Portland's big signing from Liga MX, their next big goal scorer. I shouldn't even say next big goal scorer, their current big goal scorer. The yeah. man has been producing ever since he got to the league, and Seattle figured out a way to neutralize him. Uh, I, I think part of it was tactics and formation and making sure that he's not beating anyone or, or they're not leaving him on any sort of one-on-one -on -one matchups, maybe a little zonal marking at times. Uh, but I think also they, they made sure to play him a little more physically and, and give him a few bumps and you know no easy passes through the defense type of thing. So putting all that together, they game plan for Brian Fernandez. They shut down Brian Fernandez. Look, if you give a goal up to Valeri when you're already up 2 nothing, I guess you can live with that as long as you hang on for the win. Right. And that's exactly what Seattle did. Seattle takes home the three points. The Cascadia the Cup. Cascadia Cup. Dragon right. rights for Seattle and their fans for another season. And uh, this only gives them a little more confidence should these teams meet in the Western Conference playoffs. Couldn't have said it better myself, Nick. Oh, thanks. That's why I get paid the big bucks here. <laughs> So the next game, now we're moving into Saturday, kind of an old school rivalry a little bit, maybe not as heated recently, yeah. uh, but New England hosting Chicago Fire. And I, I do remember some really good rivalry games between these two teams, you know, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, when both teams were exceptional in the league, when New England was winning all those open cups and not doing anything <laughs> and, else in the playoffs. Finishing, yeah, finishing second um, in MLS Cup final, yeah. Right, right. And I think it was, was it Stu Holden who played for the Revs back then? Or was it, it was, no, it was Taylor Twelman. Yeah, I forget Taylor what, Twelman. sorry, I'm getting my broadcasters mixed up here. <laughs> but Taylor Twelman will tell you that there are still Chicago Fire fans that will cuss at him or, or give him uh, negative comments on social media uh, because of, how his team manhandled Chicago in a lot of those games back in the day. So it would be great to see a resurgent New England and a resurgent Chicago. But in the meantime, we've got a, a middling Chicago team and a, an improving New England team who does beat the Chicago Fire 2-1, to one, continuing continuing their, their climb up the yeah, Eastern they keep, Conference. They keep like, doing well. Uh, they keep getting results. And this one, uh, a late winner by their new signing, Gustavo Bo. Uh, great goal on his part, and that's what gave them the full three points in the 86th minute. Uh, New England just keeps quietly getting it done. Uh, they're they're moving on up the table. They're not quite, you know, they're not quite sitting comfortably in a playoff spot. They're still in that fight with uh, probably five other teams in the East for those last two or three spots. But uh, it is a good one coming up next week. New England hosting Toronto. Uh, that should be a good matchup to see who's you know who's going to take that that step up into the playoff picture next week. Absolutely, and what was interesting to me in this game was was the lineups. So from New England's perspective, you had Bunbury as the striker up top, Gustavo Boo, uh, Boo and Charles Gill kind of supporting him as as attacking midfielders, so to speak. So you had you had your three best players for New England starting up top. They wanted to go out and score goals. They wanted to put the pressure on the Chicago Fire defense, who has been kind of spotty at times during the season and kind of been a little bit shuffled around. Meanwhile, you look at Chicago, let's look at that defense. Bornstein, their latest signing. Right. Calvo, DP signing from uh, from the beginning of this season. Oddly enough, Calvo gets the goal. Yeah. So coming up from the defensive spot, the Costa Rican international gets the goal for the Fire. Then you got Kapelhoff and Bronico. So I, I think... Chicago was pretty well set on, on Calvo and Kapelhoff to, in order to give Schweinsteiger a rest on occasion. He did not start this game. I don't even think he got in. He wasn't the game. even the 18. Um, so, yeah, wasn't even there. So, kind of a makeshift back line. Again, Ponovic playing with formations late in the season, making people scratch their heads. But you look at their this 4 3 3 lineup for Chicago. You had Gaetan, Nikolic, and Frankowski up front. Now, we know Ponovic doesn't like Nikolic. But yet he has to play him because Nikolic right now is the only one that yeah. has been scoring 
he's, he's the best for, option for the fire. Period. Like he, he, that's exactly it. He, he's the best option for them. Uh, he didn't get the goal this time. I don't know if it's because he wasn't offside enough to to really push the defense <laughs> and kind of make those runs and get noticed. But then supporting them in the midfield, CJ Sapong on the CJ left. CJ Sapong. Right. In the he, midfield. They what? wanted he I guess he wanted to just put all his attacking options on the field at once and kind of see what happens. Yeah. Nice. But that means Sapong's not playing defense and you've got a defensive hole. In the center, Dax McCarty. I do the guy dipped into the fountain of youth for this season, which yeah. is scary for the Chicago Fire if Dax McCarty has been one of your best players. Like that's not a shot at Dax, that's a shot at the Chicago Fire roster. Right. And then on, on the right midfield, Michael Azira, who I really don't know too much about. I feel like he's just kind of an MLS veteran, just kind of been around. I, yeah. Do you know much about Azira? I, I really Mike? don't. I know he came from Montreal uh, in that deal with Corrales, but I uh, do not know much about him other than he's just kind of been he's just been a, a guy in the league that's never really stood out, nothing that's you know been crazy. I mean, yeah. Ugandan international, I believe. Uh 32 years old. His, his profile picture, I think, is it's still his my, old Montreal jersey. Picture, yep. So uh, nothing new on, on MLSsoccer.com for, for Michael Azira. <laughs> so it was like Ponovic just conceded possession and the midfield to try and get some get some goals. And if we're going to actually look at, at the statistics, that's exactly what happened. The Revs had 60% of the ball. They had, but both teams, 10 and 11 shots each, five on goal. And it was the Revs that come out on top. So, again, interesting tactical choices by the Fire and Ponovic. Why you're doing this with a month left in the season? Like, I don't know. Like, when you, you need to play some out. desperate footy. Exactly the point. And, and even uh, John on Twitter comes in and says he's just waiting for the Fire to, to actually fire Ponovic. And then he's like, ah, Rodriguez will just take over. He can't be worse than Ponovic at this point, right? <laughs> so, who knows what's going on in Chicago? Winning soccer is not going on. No. We'll see if anything else happens as a result of that. <laughs> well, we're, we're going to keep with the Eastern Conference here, some of the early games. Uh, another rivalry match of East Coast, the Union, taking on D.C. United, coming home with three points in a 3-1 to one victory, kind of reasserting themselves as, as a top team in the Eastern Conference, while D.C. continues to slide. Yeah, D.C. continues to go down, uh, and Philly continues to stay at the top, uh, right there at the top of Atlanta United on points, uh, just down in the tiebreaker uh, for games played and, and wins. But a great result for Philly. They really took it to D.C. in this one. Uh, goals by Frisbilko, Aronson, and the El Sino, uh, And then D.C. United's only goal coming kind of in consolation. They were already down 3 nothing. It was Luciano Acosta. Uh, man, uh, I don't know what's going on with D.C. right now. But they really are struggling. Uh, you know, Quincy talks about all this MSL stuff and the men mental strength league and all this. <laughs> He's doing a great job putting it on social media. Maybe he needs to tell his guys in the locker room about it a little bit more and get them on board because it's time for D.C. to suck it up and get back to their winning ways. They've got plenty of talent on that roster. Well, let's think about it, Mike. Who has been kind of the heart and soul of your D.C. team for the last two seasons? It's been Rooney and Acosta. Two yeah. guys, now Acosta, who was rumored to go to PSG, who was in Paris, supposedly ready to sign right, with them, right, right. and it all fell through. So he had one foot out the door. And then Rooney, you know, you to, you know, he, he definitely puts on the right PR type of look, but over the course of the season, a few little quotes have leaked out. Uh, you saw him kind of BSing with Vela and Ibrahimovic at the All-Star game, like, what are we doing here? It's ridiculous. Like, maybe Rooney isn't that... MSL that that we that DC needs him to be that right. mentally yeah. strong guy at this point, especially since he got signed on as a player coach for an English Derby County yeah. Derby County for an English Championship team at, at the end of the MLS season. So he's got one foot out the door. So your two most influential guys on the field aren't there mentally. Yeah, and it's it's clearly showing with their on the field play. And uh, yeah, Quincy came, comes in in the 64th minute. Our guy Quincy Amirakwa. Yeah, hard hard to make a big change like that when you're down three nothing in the 64th minute, or three to one at that point. Right, but still, right. Uh, did didn't look like that. Um, that there's well, they much just, they just didn't it. have it in this game. Uh, yep. just didn't have it. It was all Philly, and uh, good job for Philly sets up a great matchup next week when they play Atlanta United. Uh, I think they're hosting Atlanta United, so it should be uh, should be exciting game there to watch. Next up, the 401 Derby. 
Toronto FC against Montreal. Uh, this one was one that I picked Montreal in my picks and predictions on YouTube because, uh, you know, I picked them to beat Orlando City. They draw. I pick them to beat, again, another game they should have won at Columbus. They draw. Barely. I'm like, you know what? Let's pick Montreal. Kind of a superstitious pick. And uh, even though they are, we're playing a little bit better than, than Toronto at the time. So I picked Montreal. And what do you know? TFC comes through, gets the victory, 2-1 to one hey. over Montreal. Congrats you know? for your Reds, Mike. Hey, I'm they, pretty they sure you picked it. Montreal just to make sure Toronto won. Oh, man, they, they, needed, <laughs> they needed it. They really did. Uh, and, and a good, good result for TFC. Uh, Pozuelo got dropped to the bench in this one uh, to start out. He did not start the game. He came on as a sub. Uh, oh, and wait a minute. That was not this game. Oh, there's the subs. Yeah, so it was that one. Okay. At halftime. So definitely some interesting... Uh, interesting something going on there. I don't know yet. He really hasn't been performing lately. He hasn't been scoring many goals, getting many assists uh, in the recent time. So maybe this has something to do with that, uh, trying to get his head head back in the game or something. But, uh, you know, really a, a pretty even matchup. TFC seemed to get a little bit more of the play during the first half. Um, and then all of a sudden Montreal scores. Bohan, their new signing, uh, gets shoots a, a ball from way out. And uh, great goal, great shot. And uh, you're like, oh man, this is this really happening again? Uh, and then somehow, some way, some of the old guard comes up. Marky Delgado shoots a, a rebound, that, you know, from just outside the box, and it goes through. I think two M uh, Montreal defenders' legs, and and Bush just missed it. Uh, it was like just meant to be that that ball got in. And then Justin Morrow with the deflection and barely crossed over the line before uh, Montreal cleared it off the line, but just enough for Ooh. TFC. You know, to, to get it done and win 2-1 to one, uh, over a team that they really need to beat right now with the playoff structure and really to save Greg Vanny uh, a coaching job. Yeah, I was impressed how Toronto came back from being one nothing down early on in the second half. They could have mailed it in. They could have played for a draw. They could have, you know, you know, they could have done a number of other things, but they kept pressing, and you saw that, uh, that it's, after that goal was scored, Vanny's wheels were turning about how he's going to change the tactics up. So, Boyan scores in the 49th for Montreal. In the 60th, Vanny makes his first sub. Brings in Richie Larea for Gallardo. Nice midfield switch. Well, Montreal then. Not even 10 minutes later, makes their next switch. Nice defensive midfield move there to see if they can't uh, preserve the lead, uh, preserve a draw. Or all, those, all strikers? Yeah. Anyway, well, then they're trying to play for the win at that point. Right, let me kind of right. let me backpedal a little bit on that statement after Delgado got that goal. Well, even then, Morrow comes in in the 81st and gets the goal right after the Osorio sub. So a lot of good tactical moves by by Vanny in this one. So I, I don't think he's he's on as hot of a seat as a lot of people are, are thinking, as a lot of fans are thinking, uh, just because he's still coaching out of his mind. He's still playing very well. Just when you deal with injuries, when you deal with players underperforming, when you're in an Eastern Conference that is just so, I don't even know what to call it right now, just yeah, so um, MLS-y, yeah. uh, I guess you got you to give Vanny the benefit of the doubt. Again, I'm not as plugged in as Toronto FC as you and some of the other fans are, so that's kind of my like 10,000-foot view Yeah, I mean, it, it was nice to finally see the, new, the two new TAM signings on the wings uh, start the game. I think that's, you know, kind of, it, it's, that, that's part of the, the Vanny out stuff has been, why the hell did we spend the money on these guys if we're not going to play them uh, and not even play them together? Um, so may, maybe now he's, he did have a good performance in this one and the, the result was there. So hopefully uh, it's a sign of things to come for TFC and uh, pushing their way into the playoffs. Absolutely. And the next game on Rivalry Week, New York City FC hosting and beating New York Red Bulls 2-1. to one. Just when the Red Bulls are, are kind of starting to get a little momentum, you think, hey, they beat their rivals, things are going great. Red Bulls have, have kind of been, had the upper hand in, in this derby. But sure enough, 
New York City comes back from a one nothing deficit after the 10th minute and uh, a Maxi Morales PK and an, and an Hebert goal. Again, the, the Brazilian striker Hebert coming through for him, getting the 2-1 victory. So good, good for FC, three points. Again, really kind of setting up these, these playoff matchups, kind of getting in each other's heads here about how they're going to have to play each other uh, once playoff time comes, if, if that matchup rolls up. That, that's kind of my quick take on uh, the New York Derby there, Mike. Yeah, no, I, it's, uh, you know, I didn't get a chance to watch this one, but uh, really this kind of solidifies New York City, I think, as really the three teams in the East that, are, that, that have a shot to go to MLS Cup, and that's Atlanta, Philly, and New York City. I think that's a fair assessment. Now we're moving on to the Western Conference for the next game. Uh, Real Salt Lake beats up on Colorado 2 nothing, And I think the bigger news out of, out of this game is, is Colorado getting a new head coach. Yeah. Uh, you know, RSL's fighting for, for their playoff berth. Colorado's just kind of fighting for an identity in the meantime. And, and they get a little bit of it uh, with the hiring of Robin Frazier, someone who actually played for Colorado back in the early 2000s. So... Uh, Mike, he was most recently an assistant at TFC. So what do you know about TFC and Robin Frazier? And kind of knowing how TFC has kind of built their team recently and tactically as well, what can you expect to see from Colorado moving forward? Yeah, you know, uh, he was he, – at Chivas USA, he had Greg Vanny kind of in the – was his assistant at Chivas USA. And then the, the roles kind of flipped in Toronto where Greg Vanny was the, the head coach and he brought Robin Fraser in as an assistant. Um, I think they're very, very similar in their coaching. I think that he likes to get a formation and kind of stick with that formation for a while until it stops working and then he tries to outthink himself and do something else. Um, so he's a great coach. I mean, he has tons of experience in the league. He played in the MLS for a long time. Uh, U.S. national team caps to his name. Uh, he, he's put on the red, white, and blue. Uh, this guy is everything MLS. He's got plenty of MLS experience, and I think that's huge, especially for a team like Colorado that doesn't spend a ton of money, that is kind of looking for that lower budget but still trying to be successful type of uh, you know game plan or blueprint. So. Uh, I think he's going to do well for Colorado. I think he's a good coach. I think uh, it should be interesting to see. I, I agree with you. The guy's got MLS credentials up and down. He's had over, I think he says, what, 353 appearances in the MLS, uh, you know, according to Wikipedia for, for whatever that's worth. Um, no, I'm sorry, not, not 353 in the MLS, but 353 in American soccer, yeah. the vast majority of which have been with the MLS. 27 U.S. caps. And he's been a coach in the MLS for the last decade plus. So you're right. He knows the league. And maybe, just maybe, if he can turn Colorado around at the beginning of next season, that summer transfer window, maybe Colorado finally decides to go out and buy themselves a big player. If they think Frazier's the guy. Yeah. So that's that's kind of our quick take on Frazier. But at the end of the day, Colorado walks, walks out of RSL. No goals. No points. And, again, they're just continuing to try and figure out who they're going to be in the future. Yeah, and RSL, great win for them. They're uh, they're quietly up to number two in the West whoa, right now. Whoa, whoa, um, wait a yeah. minute. RSL is the yeah. second-place team in the Western second Conference? Second-place team in the Western Conference of head of, ahead of Seattle, even on points, but ahead on wins. Number two in the West, Real Salt Lake. That, uh, I, I feel like people aren't talking about that much. Mike. They're not. We'll have to dive into that a little <laughs> bit more next week, maybe. Maybe. And see how they're going to match up. And heck, Mike, last season you saw a, a mediocre RSL team top LAFC in the first round of the playoffs. If they get a little bit of luck, they can do it again and make a run. Yeah, yeah. I, I never mean, know. There's, there's people who are saying the league wants Nick Romano to go out a champion. I, I don't know if I buy into those tinfoil conspiracies, tinfoil act conspiracies. That's going to be hard to do. But uh, it's going to be hard to do. Really but tough. you never know. You never know. All right, next up, Mike, who do we got? San Jose Earthquakes hosting Vancouver. Uh, poor Vancouver, man. They are just... I, I, I kind of am starting to feel for them now. It is just bad. San Jose wins this one 3-1. to one. Uh, Easy victory. This game was over before it even started. And uh, San Jose just fighting right around that sixth spot for the playoffs. You know, trying to, to get a little bit... The, the whole West, from 2-7, to seven, 
is separated by three points. That's one win. One win separates second place, like, oh, yeah, easily. We're in the playoffs. We got this. To, oh, my God, we're barely in the playoffs. We might be out. Okay, maybe I don't feel as crazy about RSL now being in second place when you put it like that. There you go. But, there you go. But, but, yeah, it's kind of funny to think that this Vancouver team not too long ago was like, hey, maybe this is the year they make the playoffs, or maybe this is the year we see the development. Right. So next season they make a play the playoffs or do something in the Open Cup. Yeah. Someone's got to be in last place, I guess. And right now it's Vancouver. Right now Vancouver, yep. So, and, and second worst team in the league. Only, yeah. Only above Cincinnati. So. Right, right. And tough, speaking of Tough Cincinnati, monitor to have. Yeah, speaking of, Mike. Sunday we go into the hashtag hell is real derby. And Cincinnati, I really had high hopes for this one. I thought Cincinnati was going to get it done at home. Wrong. Columbus Crew go in and lay the smackdown on FC Cincinnati. Just took it right to him at the beginning of the game. By the time it was halftime, it was 3 nothing Columbus, and they just just put a beat down on him. Right, right. Some some really good play by Giassi's artist. Again, a guy that I like to see succeed, while most people who follow oh, yeah. American soccer don't. Yeah. Uh, he had two goals in this one, and I'm sure all his critics are going to point out the two goals that he should also have had. Uh, a couple of easy ones that yeah. he probably just thought about too much. It, it's funny when, when Zardis has to make like split second reaction type of plays. He does so well with that. He's got a great first touch. He can either bring the ball down or first touch lay off like a nice 10, 12 yard pass to an onrushing teammate to set up a counterattack quick break. He does that so well. But then like if he's 12 yards out and the defenders are laying off of him and get him giving him the shot. And he can take a second to set it up and pick a spot and shoot it. He'll sky it or push yeah. it wide. Yeah. Like I, it, it's such it's such an odd kind of moment for him. This guy who's had such great experience in the MLS and on the international scene to right. not be able to put a shot on frame like that. It's it's frustrating, but he's, he's still been, got two. He's, he's still been got hanging out with uh, Pedro Santos too much. Yeah, it's apparently, apparently. But <laughs> but Santos did pick up a couple assists as well in this game. So good for yeah. him. Good on um, Columbus. Uh, good win for them to, to make Ohio black and gold for this season at least. Right. You know what, what kind of bums me out from a Cincinnati perspective is Ledesma's not getting the starts. I mean, this was one of their best players for Cincinnati in their USL days. Uh, I think he ended up winning Defender of the Year in the USL either last year or the Maybe. year before. So, some He had some award tied to him. Something where I'm like, why is Ledesma sitting on the bench to start these games for FC Cincinnati? Uh, to me, it doesn't make much sense, but hey, I guess that's why I'm doing a podcast and not coaching You're for not the coaching. MLS. Right. Or it could have something to do with the fact they don't have a Class A license because they only offer those once a year. Oh, wait, that's that's another topic to, uh, to talk about at another time, oh, about, well, about how they're stacking the licensing uh, structure against people, but anyway, three one for Columbus. Yeah, uh, good good win for Columbus. Moving along, FC Dallas with an absolute thrashing of the Houston Dynamo in the Texas Derby. And really, not much to say about this game. Dallas came out and took it to him from the first minute of the game. Uh, he had a Rito Ziegler penalty kick in the twenty fourth minute. A few minutes after that, Ferreira with a goal, and then the Cobra Zdenek Onandrasic scores twice. Uh, then Houston says, yeah, we want to get into this a little bit. And then Barrio scores all FC Dallas all day long. They are the Texas Derby champion. They get the cannon to stay on top of the roof of their stadium. And, uh, yeah, that's it. Again, good good move for Dallas to kind of project them into that, that playoff run. And then, gosh, you, could, you couldn't have planned this better if you were in the league. And it's LAFC hosting LA Galaxy in the El Trafico part de of, of this season. Yeah. Uh, part, parte dos, maybe that's more appropriate. Yeah. Um, ends up in a 3-3 tie, Mike, but but not but not short of any spectacular oh, moments or any sort of drama. The drama, here. dude. This was insane. So it's actually kind of a funny story, right? So I'm watching this game, and uh, I'm laying in bed, and I'm watching, and Zlatan scores in the second. And I'm like, assisted by Christian guy. Pavone, their newest signing. Like, oh, he yeah, comes it was in great, immediately great as an impact. Great play, immediate impact. It was a great play, great one too with these guys. Just amazing soccer. And then all of a sudden, I, you know, I'm like, oh, yeah, I need to go out to the kitchen for something. And all of a sudden, it's boom, it's 1 1. 
I go back out to the kitchen to finish getting whatever I was getting. Boom, it's 2-1. And it's 3-1. I'm like, what the hell? What's going on here? And Zlatan gets his second. Then Pavone scores. Like, wow, those two guys on the same team together, it's just unreal. It, uh, could, it could be the extra little bit of offense that the Galaxy need that gives them an option that's not Zlatan. Right, or I should say, gives them a second option because their entire offense to this point of the season has just been Zlatan. get the ball to Zlatan. Exactly. You know, Ellison Drini has definitely not been picking up the offensive slack, nor has anyone else on that team. So with Pavone, it gives them a second dimension, a second option, makes them a lot more dangerous. And the fact that it looks like Pavone and Ibrahimovic are playing well together and can play off of each other makes it even more dangerous. That assist on that first, uh, I think it, it was his first, first goal, goal yeah. to just lob it just over the head of the defender. Oh, yeah. It was beautiful. It was. I mean, this is some great soccer. And I'm, I'm really not trying to, like, drink the MLS Kool-Aid <laughs> and be like, oh, LAFCLA is the greatest matchup in the history of America. Like, I'm not trying to drink the MLS Kool-Aid. There were some really good goals, really good assists, and oh, yeah. some really excellent play on both sides of, of the ball here. Yeah, um, one, one note here, this one, uh, Carlos Vela scores in the 53rd minute and then comes out as a substitute. Uh, he was pissed uh, in the 61st minute. They put in the new signing, Brian Rodriguez, who played extremely well. I mean, that guy looked good in the few minutes that I saw of him playing. Um, the only thing that I'm going to say about this with Vela, I understand the, the heat and the intensity of playing in a rivalry game like this. But when you throw the captain's armband down on the ground like it's nothing and like it's garbage, I don't care how pissed off you are, you don't do that. That, to me, I lost a lot of respect for Vela in this one. I get that you're fired up. I get that you only think it's something light and your coach is being precautious because you're already 20 points ahead of these guys. So in the long run, we don't want to lose the best player in league history to this point of the season. Um, because of you know one point or two points or three points here against LA Galaxy, but don't throw the captain's armband down to the ground. That's that's where I've got a little bit of a, a, a beef with that one. Yeah, I'm not trying to take away anything that that you're saying about that, Mike. But the one thing too that we got to mention is uh, Vela has a minor injury to his hamstring, so maybe the coaching staff, the medical staff, noticed something. Oh, like, I did. We we got to get him out of here. Yeah. Yeah. And so maybe his frustration, yeah, it's definitely from on the field that right. they had to come back, that he's got to put up with Zlatan, that he's got to put up with the Crosstown rivalry. The fact that LAFC have not beaten right. LA Galaxy in five tries. They, they have either lost or drawn every right. – drawn? Drew? Lost or, or tied every time. Yep. Um, but then he has also got this minor hamstring injury. So he's, he's pissed on all sorts of levels. So you're right – I, I I don't think he should take it out on the captain's armband. I mean that's just terrible optics, and you never know how the team is going to react. Right, right. But but I can't say I, I totally uh, I'm going to dismiss it. Like he, I definitely can see why you would be doing that. Right. No, for sure, and, and I get that. But that, that's just my standpoint on that one. All right. So uh, those are those are all the games from Rivalry Week, and uh, we appreciate you guys listening in. We have talked enough for just over an hour now. So uh, thank you for listening. Thanks again to our sponsors, Nice Iceland Pure Spring Water, Donovan Food Brokerage. Thank you for your support. Fans, thank you for listening. Find us at SOP Soccer on Twitter. Check out our new YouTube channel for my picks and predictions. And we will talk to you guys next week.